Hi, everyone. Welcome to the ARCS National Center on Criminal Justice and Disability webinar. My name is Katherine Walker, and I'm today's facilitator. Before we begin our presentation, I'd like to cover a few rules, especially for those of you who are new to WebEx. Because there are so many of you, all participants are in listen-only mode. At any time during the presentation, if you need help, you can post a question in the chat box on the side of your screen. We'll be happy to help you. At the end of the session, there will be a time for questions. You can either post questions in the Q&A section or in the chat box. If you want your question to stay private, type private before your question. You can also email questions to nccjdinfo at thearcs.org. If we don't get to your question during the presentation, we'll follow up with you afterwards. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our website. We will send you an email letting you know when it is available. During the presentation, you will be asked to answer a few questions. These questions help us document your involvement for our funders, so please participate. We have one final request. You will receive a session evaluation after this webinar. Please take five minutes to complete and send it to us. This webinar is funded by the United States Department of Justice Bureau of Justice Assistance. Thanks for your participation. The webinar today is the eighth of NCCJD's monthly webinars and features Jessica Oppenheim, Esquire, with the Arc of New Jersey. Before we welcome Jessica, please answer the polling questions. All right, the first polling question. True or false, people with IDD are more likely to commit criminal offenses than people who do not have an IDD. Polling question number two, true or false? People with IDD are more likely to have criminal charges dismissed than their co-defendants without a disability. Number three, true or false, employment and support services can have a positive impact on future recidivism. And finally, true or false, Criminal justice professionals are well-versed in the obstacles faced by individuals with IDD and understand the services that can help support them in the community. Thanks for your participation with the polls. If you didn't get a chance to answer the questions here, the same questions will appear on the post-webinar survey. All right. Thank you for your participation. Now please welcome our presenter, Jessica Oppenheim. So this is returning to me, correct? Can you hear me? Good. I'm all set. Good. Yep, I'm, I good. apologize. I'm, I'm 
a newbie to high tech. I'm used to talking to people face to face, so hopefully everybody can hear me. Um, but that's right. Thank you, Catherine. My name is Jessica Oppenheim, and I appreciate so many of you joining us on a, on a beautiful summer day on a topic that can be complex and uh, is not particularly popular, talking about individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities who become involved in the criminal justice system. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the Criminal Justice Advocacy Program in New Jersey already. We used to be the Developmentally Disabled Offenders Program. Uh, we changed our name about four years ago when I came to the program, mostly to become a more person-first friendly title. Uh, also to really demonstrate um, and we're going to talk about this a little in a little more detail, what I like to think of as extreme case management for our clients, but we also do a great deal of training for all members of professional staff on the criminal justice and social service side. So hopefully this title really uh, demonstrates that. You wouldn't believe we actually practiced this. How do I make it go to the next slide? Oh, up here, I see it all comes back to you. can be fast. Okay, as with the general population, of course we know people with intellectual and developmental disabilities are generally law-abiding citizens. Uh, there are no more, all the research tells us, that there are no more dangerous in the community than anyone else, just people in the general population. People with intellectual and developmental disabilities and mental health issues are no more dangerous than anyone else. Nonetheless, they tend to be overrepresented in the criminal justice system. We do know that. About 3% of the general population are comprised of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. In contrast, the prison population is at about 9 or even 10%. You can see it's about three times the number are individuals with a developmental disability. So that gives you an idea. Here are just some more statistics. Numbers tend to be a little soft on this topic. For example, in Canada in 2009, they did a pretty comprehensive study that placed the number as as much as 50% of the population of individuals in their prison system some identifiable intellectual or developmental disability. So that gives you an idea of the vast issue that we're talking about here. Over the course of the next hour, and I'm going to talk very fast because it's not a lot of time, and I'm from New Jersey, so we tend to talk fast. Uh, we're going to cover some of the characteristics of this population, some of the obstacles particularly that they face when they're dealing with this issue, and I'm going to talk particularly about the program. Now, criminal justice professionals, I just want to define that term a little. It's a very broad definition. Put it in perspective, New Jersey, for example, set a population of 9 million people. We have 600 law enforcement agencies, about 38 to 48,000 foreign law enforcement officers who run the gamut from officers in big cities like New York, a, a, a law enforcement agency of about 2,000 people, all the way down to one and two man departments in what we consider to be rural communities. So we're trying to get our message out to a very broad population. We have 21 county prosecutors who are the chief law enforcement officer in their county. So compared, say, to Texas or some larger states, we're a relatively small community, but we actually have a very large population of foreign law enforcement officers. And the reality is that they know literally nothing about people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. There's very little training provided. And unless they have some personal connection to that group of people, they're really not going to know anything at all. In contrast, we're trying to make that connection between that criminal justice system and the system of social services, people out in the world, those professionals who are social workers who provide services to the community, and they are not historically created to work with criminal offenders. They really struggle with how they're going to uh, provide appropriate services for this community, keep other members of their community safe at the same time, keep themselves safe, and yet provide good, effective services. The reality is that having an identifiable intellectual or developmental disability simply is not a bar. It's not a bar to arrest. It's not a bar to prosecution. It's not a bar to conviction. And that's why the kinds of services that we can provide, those alternatives to incarceration and support services that surround the individual are particularly important. So what do we know? 
There's research that tells us that any criminal offender, whether they have a disability or not, will do better. In other words, will reduce their recidivism when they have supervision or at least believe, feel that they have supervision and are gainfully employed or have some level of activity. Idle hands really are the devil's playthrough. It does make a difference in, in the lives of everyone and particularly, particularly people with intellectual or developmental disabilities that they know there's some level of supervision and that um, they have something to do all day. Something that gives them a sense of um, accomplishment, makes people feel that they're part of a community. Very important. But nonetheless, our system, and I imagine that most state systems don't provide a lot of specialized attention or supervision for these individuals. And we're, you're going to see a theme going through this discussion about the difficulties, the key challenges of ensuring that people have work and that they have a place to live. Housing and jobs are probably our key difficulties. Is that's what we were just talking about, and what's the result of that? If they don't have good connections in the community, finding appropriate housing, appropriate job training, jobs that they can succeed at, we see recidivism. Now, this is a very, very short description of the kinds of problems that we're talking about, all the way from the beginning of that initial interaction with law enforcement. Someone with an intellectual or developmental disability, and that's a wide range of individuals, as I'm sure everybody on this webinar knows, won't necessarily understand their rights as they're read to them by rights. Of course, I mean Miranda warnings, everybody watches law and order. So you all know that means that you have a right to remain silent, a right to an attorney, a right to have an attorney assigned to you if you can't afford one. Sounds pretty simple. But if you have cognitive limitations, these concepts can be very difficult to understand. And it's not law enforcement's job to ensure that that person really understands it. So you get a lot of yes answers, particularly you're talking about individuals who've been taught over the course of their lives to be um, respectful, to work well with anybody who's an authority figure. They're going to want to please that authority figure so the attempt is to try and say something that they, that they want to hear. Um, there may even be a, a possibility of regressing out of fear. It's a very anxiety producing situation to be dealing with somebody who's in uniform, squad car, squawk box, all of that um, activity going on around you. It's a very frightening situation. We also know that the client base we're working with are not particularly interested in informing anyone that they have an issue. Uh, in the past, we've tried handing out small wallet cards to our clients with their name and their case manager's name. They're really not interested in giving out that information. Generally speaking, most people are not interested in having uh, people know that they have any kind of issue, right? They're going to they're going to try and and uh, and cope on their own. So, what does that leave us with? The reality is, the, the statistics tell us, the research tells us that offenders with developmental intellectual disabilities are simply more likely to be guilty. They're more likely to be guilty to the original charges, which ends up in uh, longer prison sentences that we're going to talk about a little bit more in a minute. This is really the front end of the problem, and you'll see that the issues follow all the way through. Into sentencing. We begin with those original charges and all the way through sentencing. Now we have additional, additional issues that uh, demonstrate that disadvantaged position, back end of the process. Probation and other diversionary non-institutional programs, for example, drug court, a very effective program, but it's very difficult to participate in. It has a lot of rules and regulations, a lot of requirements that an individual has to meet. It can be hard for our clients to be successful. If you're not going to be successful in a program, it's more likely that the program's not going to accept you, right? They want good prospects for their program. So our clients tend to not be accepted for programs like drug court. Appeals, direct appeals of a conviction, motions for both conviction relief, which are ancillary attacks on a conviction. You have to be able to request those things. You have to be able to work effectively with your attorney. Clients that we have with an intellectual or developmental disability may not be able to really communicate well with their attorney effectively with their attorney, and so a lot of those opportunities are lost. Probation, we're going to touch on that a little bit more later. Again, at the back end of the process, in order to comply with probation, there are a lot of conditions that have to be met. These are some of the examples of those. 
you can't meet those conditions, you're violated on probation, it results in a return to prison. All the way to the end, re-entry. Let's assume our clients do end up in county jail or state prison. Ultimately, they're going to re-enter the community. And as we can tell you, you probably are already aware there are serious obstacles to getting effective housing, appropriate housing, finding jobs. Despite the fact that there are attempts now to, to ameliorate the effects of having a criminal history on the ability to find jobs, things like ban the box statutes, which keep employers from asking up front about criminal history, nonetheless, Imagine you have difficulties with the job anyway, and now we add two of those criminal histories. There's no question that we have a serious problem on our hands, a housing crisis and a job crisis for this population. So where do we come in? Well, our goal is essentially to provide an alternative to incarceration. Our clients don't do well, and we'll talk a little later about uh, the prison system and the problems that our clients experience when they're part of that. Uh, so our goal really is to provide, as I said earlier, extreme case management for our clients. They are people who are eligible for services from our Division of Developmental Disabilities in the Department of Human Services. They already are entitled to certain services, possibly entitled to some housing alternatives, but our goal really is to coordinate those services along with other needs in the community provide that case management, and essentially convince the court and the prosecutor that this is an alternative that can result in the person being successfully held in the community. Uh, we also, as I've noted here, uh, try and do a great deal of training, both for the, for the criminal justice side about people with developmental disabilities, and also on the other side for uh, the social service community so that they understand what's going on in the criminal system. With our staff, we have three and a half case managers. We run the gamut of the entire state, which is 21 counties. Unlike some of your states, we actually can drive from one end to the other, uh, from one end to the, to the other within a day. But uh, nonetheless, we cover a lot of ground. It's about 100 cases at any given time. I noted before we've been in existence for a while. It's been since 1985. Uh, we really are uh, the only one in New Jersey. If there are a handful nationwide. I'll just point out a couple of those. North Dakota, Colorado, Georgia, uh, D.C., District of Columbia, and St. Louis, Missouri all have programs similar to ours. So that's what five or six nationwide. Um, we try and communicate with them. Uh, Colorado in particular, shout out to them. They've got they do some really interesting uh, work with their clients. So. There are a few out there. Hopefully, we can see an expansion of this. We run an annual conference that tries to bring these two groups together. We currently got a pilot program that we're running in one of our counties to work particularly in the reentry field. So it's a, it's a broad array of, um, of topics that we cover. So what do we do particularly for our clients? Well, the goal really is to look for any existing service out in the community that can improve the likelihood that they will not commit a new offense. It's as simple as that. Everything from drug treatment, recreational programs, respite, job training, residential, when we can, we have become very creative with that, and that I think is a topic for another day. You'll note under psychologists and therapists that one of the things I've pointed out is therapy and services for sexual offenders. I'm going to talk a little bit later about uh, sex offending in the, in the uh, intellectual and developmental disability community. The reality is that routinely more than half of our client base have been convicted of a sex offense, both juvenile and adult. So we know that this is even a separate issue unto itself, and we really try and address that for the courts and for the prosecutors. What we ultimately create, we call a personalized justice plan, a PJC. It's pretty much what it sounds like. We put together a plan for the offender. Uh, as you can see, one of the things we try and do is make sure that that individual is ready to be a part of this process. As you know, if any of you are working in drug court, probation, parole, you know if the offender is not going to be compliant with the conditions that are being offered, it can be very difficult to have success. One of the things we've done in the past has been successful is actually create what looks like a contract with our clients, a list of all the conditions they're going to meet. They sign it. It may not be legally binding. But it goes hand in hand with that idea of knowing that you're being supervised and watched. Having that sense that they have these obligations they have to fulfill can really make a difference. We'll finalize that plan, give it to the court, 
hopefully the court will accept it. That's the goal of this ultimately, that we can provide this in lieu of a state prison term. We'll set forth all the specifics, every all the parties, defense counsel, the prosecutor, the court, all accept it. We'll show up in court and explain whatever needs to be explained. And hopefully in a perfect world, our clients are placed on a probationary sentence. Our PJT can be a condition of that probation. We'll work hand in hand with the probation officers to ensure that those conditions are met. They can successfully complete probation. And that's really the best case scenario, uh, other than having charges dismissed, which uh, we also are sometimes successful at doing, particularly at a lower municipal court level, which is um, uh, disorderly person. So that's essentially what we're doing on behalf of our clients. Sometimes our clients are found in property to stand back. Again, a topic for a whole other webinar when we're talking about the ability for someone to be competent to stand trial, to be able to orient to time and place, and assist their counsel effectively at trial. So let's say they're found incompetent. Ultimately, in New Jersey, every state's subject to their own law, but in New Jersey, ultimately, those charges may well be dismissed, which results in no real legal obligation on the part of these clients. But our goal, as I said, is to avoid recidivism. We're trying to, to take a longer view than just disposing of the current offense. In light of that, we'll put together a few days even for individuals who have a problem. They may end up for a period of time in a psychiatric facility, something like that. When they come back out, our goal really is to ensure that they can be successful back in the community. So let's say that probation is not acceptable to the court, which can happen. Sometimes community placement is not the ultimate resolution of our cases. We don't close them at that point, however. We're really interested in that reentry fee, the final resolution of the matter. So sometimes our clients end up in prison. Sometimes our clients, as I noted, end up in a treatment facility at some time. We'll maintain a relationship with the social service program at that facility, make sure they understand what kind of disability they're talking about when they deal with our client. These kinds of programs they do have, though I will say that the New Jersey Department of Corrections has very little uh, in the way of programs specifically for this client case. But nonetheless, we find what we can possibly keep them out of general population if they're going to be uh, in a dangerous situation. We'll follow them through that process of going to prison. So that's what we do. That gives you a, just an overview of how we work individually with our clients. Some of our clients we've had for many years. Uh, for example, and I'm going to talk about this briefly in a minute, Megan's Law. Individuals have to register, have some level of community notification. Every single state has this. Those who are on parole supervision for life will hang on to those cases. We keep them as open cases to ensure that those individuals can comply with those obligations. So who are we talking about? Let's use a general profile of an offender with development disabilities. One of the things I want to point out is how closely it tracks the profiles you would have of any offender. Generally speaking, in the criminal justice arena, most people are young males with a, a, a low socioeconomic status. That's the bulk of the offenders that are being represented in, in the criminal justice system. Same with our clients. Male, mild intellectual, mild to moderate intellectual disability actors, even broader than just the mild range. Basically, 20 to 40, we know it's more young people who commit offenses. I'll point out again, sexually related offenses, not at all uncommon. Our clients are often aware of, but we'll try and hide that disability. You have to note, they are, when there are co defendants involved, our clients are very rarely the ring leader of the operation. They're acting in concert with others. They're often used by more savvy co defendants to either hold a weapon, hold more of the drugs, those kinds of things that put them in more danger because they're, they're anxious to be a part of the group, they mistake the wrong people for friends, all, all the, of the kinds of concerns that you would imagine. And here they are, the characteristics of people with developmental disabilities. One of the things I want to point out about this as well is that not only are these characteristics of people with developmental disabilities who become involved in the criminal justice system, but similarly, these are individuals who are vulnerable to victimization as well. There are real correlations, generally speaking, people with a developmental disability. We know they're particularly vulnerable 
to be the victim of crimes, violent crimes in particular, sexual assault, for example. We know that similar characteristics and similar concerns. That lack of social skills, for example, makes can make a, a young woman with an intellectual or developmental disability highly vulnerable. Similarly, too, we've noticed a real increase in our client base of people who have committed a sexual assault, young men in their 20s, early to mid-20s, getting involved with girls who are too young to legally consent to have a sexual relationship, 12, 13, 14 year old girls. And that's the problem that we see with that group. Um, some of the other concerns, I'll just note moral development. I'm really talking about understanding the difference between right and wrong, understanding what's the unappropriate action in an appropriate setting. Uh, the world can be a very complicated place. It's something we've spent many years, all of us, who may be neurotypical, learning a lot of these things. If it, if it comes, doesn't come naturally or easily to you and you're not getting the right kinds of support to train it, it's particularly a problem. And that's what we're seeing with this, this universe of people. These cause a particular problem with prosecution. These legal issues, we've touched on them a little bit already. That confidence to waive Miranda warnings, that competency issue is a huge one. Uh, here in New Jersey, there's uh, very little case law on it. I know in other states we're in a similar situation, having confidence in trial. And PC 4 2 is our penal code section with regard to competency. These are major issues that are really in, in need of some, some case law, some litigation, so I'll be curious to see how that plays out. Since I have the time, what I wanted to do was to show you just a quick case study of one of our offenders. Uh, CM, as you can see, was charged with over 15 counts, some some fairly serious ones, uh, animal, animal abuse, those are the kinds of things that actually got him on the front page of his local newspaper. Pretty upsetting in a, in a relatively rural community. It was built, uh, they, he had a co defendant killed some chickens. They set a barn on fire. These were some really serious allegations, which will give you an idea of what we're looking at. Sam was diagnosed with FASD at the age of 18 months. Um, FASD, if you think back to some of those characteristics that I talked about earlier, that impulsivity, that inability to control oneself, willingness to do just about anything. Those are real problems for people with FASD and the whole host of diagnoses that go with that. I know the next webinar is really going to focus on that issue and it is a huge one. This individual on top of it also had a diagnosis of mental illness. That dual diagnosis is a very common problem. He wasn't being properly medicated. He wasn't getting the right care. In the meantime, his parents did contact the Division of Developmental Disabilities here in New Jersey, completed the application. He was ultimately found eligible for services. What he really needed was an appropriate place to live. What happened, unfortunately, is he slipped through the cracks and ended up living in a motel. That's a very bad match for our clients, as I'm sure you know. He found a lot of the wrong individuals, stopped taking his medication, and ultimately he had a three to four day time stint. He was the first one arrested. He gave a very detailed explanation of what they'd all been doing, so he put himself in a bad situation. Fortunately, at that point, they made contact with our agency. He was a client already of the division. We had an availability of some services, and we were able to coordinate all those services. We found an appropriate behavioral group home to live in. The division was able to, to support that. Um, when you can see on there under court, it says MH probation. That refers to mental health, health probation. A recent addition to our toolbox here in New Jersey is the addition in our probation services in each county of a mental health probation officer. We often ask to have our clients be part of that program, get a mental health expert as their probation officer, and that is a, can be a big help. In, um, in improving the possibility that we're going to have uh, a, uh, a, a successful outcome for the matter. We got him the appropriate services, and I can tell you, two years into his probationary sentence, he's doing pretty well, hasn't had any new offenses, uh, you know, the occasional slippage in terms of medication or, or drug use, but because we're available, because we can make sure those services are in place, we have seen an improvement. And over time, when we look at our numbers, we do see a, a reduction in recidivism among the clients that we're able to have. 
I mentioned this earlier, sex offenses. Um, uh, in, in full disclosure, I'm, I'm the person who wrote the guidelines for Megan's Law in New Jersey, and I guess we sort of qualified ground zero for it. So perhaps I'm particularly sensitive to the topic, but I don't think so. As I noted, more than half of our client base has committed a sex offense. In New Jersey, we register both adults and juveniles, and so we, we run the gamut of age from 14 and 15 year olds all the way up to, uh, to adult men mostly men, some women, but mostly men, runs the gamut of offenses as well. Force is rarely an issue. Uh, we're almost always talking about either incest situations, that's true general for sex offending, by the way, not just for our client base, but incest offenses are probably the most common type of sex offense out there. They rarely involve force, more of a, a coercive, uh, imbalanced relationship. But nonetheless, Let's say we have a client who's 21 or 22 year, years old and has a sexual relationship with a 15 year old. That person is guilty of a second degree aggravated sexual assault in New Jersey. And that's going to result in all, besides a possibility of a state prison term, these impacts from what you all think of as Megan for, which is registration, community notification. There may be a mandatory sentence of parole supervision for life. I think most states are doing some version of that. And it is exactly what it sounds like. A parole officer will oversee that individual with a very lengthy and specific list of conditions over their life. There are possibilities of getting out from under it after 16 years, but it's limited to certain offenses. The sexually violent predator commitment, I believe most states have some version of the commitment. It's a carve out to civil commitments for people with mental health needs. Right now in New Jersey, we've got about 460 offenders who have been designated sexually violent predators. They have a number of individuals in that facility who do have intellectual and development disabilities. So we know that they're out there. So what else do we want to talk about? I just want to touch on this prison issue because we haven't really talked about it. We do know that the research tells us that they are more likely to be incarcerated for longer terms for a variety of reasons, but one of those reasons in a state prison setting can be an inability to comply with disciplinary rules and regulations. As some of you, if any of you are familiar with your prison system, will know a failure to comply with those rules and regulations changes the release date. It won't be those dates. Our clients also are often not successful in their bid for a parole from being released on parole. Again, for a number of reasons, but in order to be paroled in New Jersey, you need to be able to show that you have a home to go to, a job to go to, you're not going to be a burden on society, you're going to be successful in the community. It can be very difficult for our clients to meet that burden. There also may not be appropriate programs for them in prison. Prisons do now, some of them, provide uh, access to college education classes or continuing education or, or um, high school GED equivalency courses, our clients really may not be able to access those and not appropriate for their needs. And so it reduces the likelihood of school in the future. I just want to mention uh, that I noted that there is uh, some protection out there for individuals who are in prison. Some of you may be aware of the Supreme Court decision, Pennsylvania Department of Corrections versus Yaski. 88 requirements should apply to all state prisoners. So that means, of course, that our clients, if they have a diagnosed intellectual and developmental disability, they should be entitled to reasonable accommodations if needed for them to be in compliance with ADA requirements. Again, too, for if anyone on the line has, uh, is from California, uh, your, your prisoner law office did a great job in this case. Uh, they've worked very hard to make sure that inmates with intellectual and developmental disability are getting safe housing and supportive services out in uh, the California Department of Corrections. And I just wanted to share with all of you this, uh, this quote from the district court judge, because I think it really sums up the concern that we have, why we are so anxious to ensure that our clients avoid those periods in state prison or if they can't, if they get services, and I apologize up front, it's an older case, so the term mentally retarded is part of the quote. 
What the judge said was that evidence demonstrates that mentally retarded prisoners and those with autism spectrum disorders are verbally, physically, and sexually assaulted, exploited, and discriminated against in California prisons. I think we all know that to be the case, and that's one of our goals in having this program, one of our goals in trying to open up communications with the criminal justice system at all levels, local law enforcement all the way up to prison so that's a very quick overview of the program that we have. If there are any questions, uh, please feel free to ask them. You can see I've given you my contact information. I'd also ask anybody who's interested, please go on our website. All of our materials are there. You're welcome to download any. So uh, we have a video there that's about an 18 minute video for law enforcement that if any of you find that useful, please use. Uh, you'll find brochures and information about our program. And that's it. All right. Thanks, Jessica. Uh, I, I do have a couple of questions for you. The first one is from Leah, and she wants to know, do discrepancies in racial representation among incarcerated people in general map onto the population of incarcerated people with intellectual and developmental disabilities? Unfortunately, yes. The reality is that if you're talking, it's, it's SES, it's social economic status. That's really the key. Poor people are generally more likely, regardless of whether or not they have a disability, are simply more likely to end up in prison. They're less likely to be able to afford their own counsel. They're more likely to not get the kind of support and services that somebody with their own personal um, uh, things that they can look to, family, supportive family, um, jobs, things like that. It, that. That's simply the reality of our criminal justice system. Yes, more people of color are, are represented in prison across the board. All right, thank you. Uh, the next question is from Gia. She says, you indicated there was a small card that you all tried to use for consumers, and they've been batting around trying to implement that. Would you mind sharing or talking a little more about that? I'd be happy to. I, it, it, I think it's a good idea, but what we had created were small wallet cards, cards that said, um, this is my name, this is the name of my case manager, this is the disability that I have. It's really aimed at a law enforcement officer. Um, the problem that we found was that our client base was really reluctant to carry those. So I think um, one of the obstacles you're going to face that you're going to want to deal with is who's insane. The clients that you're working with, if this is a good thing, that they want to take advantage of this opportunity to communicate with law enforcement. We weren't particularly successful at it. I do try and go out and speak to the self-advocacy community as much as possible, and when we do, I bring, still bring copies of the wallet cards. We've just found, historically, they're not particularly interested in carrying it. So I'd be curious to hear if you do implement that, how that works out. All right, this next one is from Dawn. She says, what suggestions do you have for advocating for offenders with IDD to employers, especially when a job requires a background check? Oh, that's a sadly, as you can see through this presentation, that, that, that job development is such a huge issue. Um, you're right, over 90% of employers now are doing background checks. What concerns me is, that the way they do background checks, most of them use a private company that they're paying, and often the information they're getting may not be correct. So one of the things I just want to point out to you is ensure that the information that the employee is getting is even correct. Sometimes they're basing it just on a name, for example, and they simply have information that is inaccurate. And a lot of times our clients simply aren't good at self-reporting. You know, a criminal offense that may have occurred 15 years ago or 10 years ago, they won't necessarily remember. Um, take advantage, too, of the state's expungement statute. Um, we have one in New Jersey. It's very specific, so it doesn't assist everyone. It's not a panacea, but if it's available to you, take that opportunity to expunge old offenses before you get there. Now, dealing with directly with the employer, hopefully your state is passing what we call here in New Jersey a ban-the-box registration. A lot of employers now are using online applications. So you never get to talk to a human being. You're filling out an application online. The minute they check off that box, since the ban, the box concept, they check off that box and they have a criminal history, and that, that 
application is simply wrong. It's not going to be considered anymore. The nice thing, the good thing about supported employment, having a job developer working with you, is that you have the opportunity to have that conversation directly with the employer. Very often, offenses on paper sound a lot worse than they really are. So it's a good opportunity to explain, for example, that this was an experience and offense as it looks. Um, an opportunity to explain that this is a person with an intellectual disability and there maybe might have been extenuating circumstances that resulted in that offense. So if you have that opportunity to have that direct conversation, you at least have an opportunity to clear up some of those issues. But is it a problem? I think so. All right. I, I, I know that touched on a lot of things, so I hope that's helpful. That helps, that's helpful. And this next question is from Margaret. What percentage of the offenders you work with are diagnosed with FASD? My experience is that they are the highest number of IDD folks involved with the criminal justice system. You know, I suspect it's a large number. I have to tell you, a lot of our clients who I suspect have FASD, we are not getting a real diagnosis. If you can't uh, determine whether or not the mother drank during pregnancy and just a quick PSA, I think everybody on this webinar is probably aware that it's the most uh, uh, preventable developmental disability that they have. If mom doesn't drink during pregnancy, you don't have that problem. But here in New Jersey, we do have four FASD diagnostic centers. So if, we can, if, if clients can come through that or have, a, have that available to them, we have an actual diagnosis. The short version is I suspect we have many. Many of them are not diagnosed because we don't know mother's history. If there's an adoption or some other reason we, why we don't have that information, we can't get a formal diagnosis of the so you, you have to rely on, on the other symptoms. All right, this is from Teresa. Did your organization pass legislation to establish your agency and to provide an alternative to incarceration, or do you just pursue on a case-by-case -case basis with each individual court? Ooh, legislation, what a great idea. I am going to have to try that. No, unfortunately, the, the way we're set up is we're fully funded by our Division of Developmental Disabilities. So we, we're a contracted agency. We're a private nonprofit with a contract with a state agency. They provide the funding for our case managers and our support services. Uh, so the, that's why the client base that we deal with are all individuals with clients of that division. But I like your idea about legislation. I think I'm going to pursue that. All right, this question is from Barb. Um, do you have some ideas on supporting individuals in day programs that are reluctant to work with individuals with criminal offenses, sex offenders, and given their day programming ratio? Um, and then real fast, Barb also wants to know when your annual conference is. Ah, this year the annual conference is April 30th, and I think the topic is going to be dual diagnosis. Uh, as you, you touched on that a little bit, that's a big issue here. Um, uh, you're right. Getting support coordinators, support services to work with this population can be very challenging. One of the things I do is we go out and do training. Um, I, I have one that we do for our case managers called what do I do if my client gets arrested, just to give them an understanding of the criminal justice system. But we go out and talk to programs all the time about um, what it means if they have somebody who has a criminal history or what it doesn't mean. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that this individual is any more dangerous than anyone else. We try and give them an idea of some of the things they need to look to. We ensure, too, that besides that great program, there are other services in place that they may need. Um, medication monitoring, for example, or if they need to go into NA or AA, or some version of that that they're doing that. Therapy, particularly sex offender specific treatment, is so important for people with a true sex offender history. I can't I, I'm, I'm a big proponent of that. It works when it's, when it's the right treatment matched with the right offender. So, it, 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 again, it's those personal relationships. So we every opportunity to can communicate between the criminal justice system and that social service system, your clients and your clients particularly need the jobs and housing and the individuals who provide that support service. All right, this question is from Dana. How do we get the DA's office not to charge clients that live in a foster care home or a 24-hour residential group home? Well, you're probably not going to get them to not charge them. Um, 
Having a disability, I, I mentioned earlier, it's not a bar. Um, I, I hear your frustration, though, and we certainly have had situations here where um, we have charges being brought against individuals who shouldn't be brought. If you can take that opportunity to go directly to your VA, give them the training that they need about what these issues are so they can make as early a diagnosis as possible of what the situation is, you might be able to intervene. If you can ensure them that this person isn't going to be a danger to the community, that can often um, uh, calm the situation, get them to agree. Remember, I'm, I'm assuming that DAs in your state have the same prosecutorial discretion that we have here as a prosecutor. I was a prosecutor for 27 years, and it was really up to me to make decisions about the ultimate disposition of those charges, but it really helps if they have the information you want them to have. So take every opportunity you can to do training. Training, training. Go out there, have a meeting with them, communicate with them. Police chief in your municipalities, if you have that, sheriff, if it's a sheriff system, so that they have an opportunity to learn before the incident happens what your population is like, what some of the issues might be, what might help everybody, and be ready to offer some support from your end so that they feel comfortable in not going forward. And then you take it on a case by case basis. This question is from Deb. So what do you believe would be most helpful to have to offer folks in this situation? Legal advocacy support, specialized courts, education for law enforcement. Um, I think Deb is looking at getting started in this direction, and where would you start? I can't pick all of the above. I all of the above. I, I have to tell you a little of, of two of them. Education, I think, is imperative for everybody. And uh, one of the, the obstacles I know that, that Leanne and I have talked about in the past is the sustainability of that training and education. You, you have to be aware that you're not going to do it once, and you're not going to do it for just one year. Information about people with intellectual and developmental disabilities has to be institutionalized, has to be a part of what goes out to every police academy class out to every agency over and over again, and you have to realize that you're never going to be done with it. Um, that was a, a hard lesson for me to learn. I've done training in the past and thought, well, they're good, we're done. The reality is you're never done. You have to keep doing that over and over again. So the extent to which you can put together good materials and you can get those materials disseminated, that's a good place to start. Together with that, to the extent that you can start a program that allows you to have some impact on case management, that would be great. I don't know if anybody here is uh, is from Ohio. Ohio doesn't specifically have a program like ours, but one of the things they have done is set up what essentially I would call a multidisciplinary team uh, at the county level. They're doing it in Cuyahoga County, which is what Cleveland is. And they, they really have all the right people at the table communicating with each other. Uh, that's another great start. We're just beginning to do that here in New Jersey with mental health issues, and, and we've included intellectual and developmental disability issues into that group. So a, a good place to start besides education might be before you're ready to really get off the ground is if you put together a multidisciplinary team, a task force of the right people, and I emphasize the right people at the table, and all the different disciplines together, you can start putting a program together. All right, this question is from Joanna. She says, have you ever used the SAS spatial computer analysis that they're using in Canada? No, I never have. Um, you know, we're not a clinical agency. We just provide services, but I'd be, I'd be interested to, to hear what people are finding with it. It's just, if it's just Canada or if anybody, any of the states are using it. All right, this next one is from Gail. Are your case management services voluntary or are they court ordered? In a perfect world, they are court ordered. Our clients aren't the ones who have, um, it's not voluntary for the client. The Division of Developmental Disabilities, being a, a, a person eligible for services from the division, that's voluntary. So in reality, clients can refuse to be eligible for services from the Division of Developmental Disabilities assuming that they're their own guardian and able to make those decisions. But once we've reached a point where we've had involvement, in other words, the person's a client of the Division of Developmental Disabilities, and 
they're already involved in the criminal justice system. What we try and do is make our personalized justice plan part of probation. Once it's part of the probationary sentence, then it's not voluntary on the part of the client. They have to meet those conditions, but what they face is potential violation of probation. That's in a perfect world. All right, thanks. And um, I just wanted to give a quick mention to something that NCCJD is working on. When you're talking about getting all the professionals together, we're working on getting some information on creating a DRP, a disability response team. So look out for that on our website in the future. Um, and this next question is from Erica. Do the majority of the people with IDD involved in the justice system have surrogates or guardians, or do the majority not have advocates to provide these supports and assistance? In our experience, the majority do not have guardians. Guardianship is a, is a pretty broad concept in New Jersey. An individual can have a guardian only for financial purposes, for example, or for medical needs. So it may be a limited guardianship that won't impact on the criminal justice piece at all. Um, most of the individuals in any event who are at a point to get themselves involved in criminal offenses often do not have a guardian. I would say 80% of our clients are their own guardian, and we have a small number where there's a parent or a sibling who's a guardian, and an even, an even smaller percentage, an individual who may have guardianship through our Bureau of Guardianship Services. So no, the bulk of them are their own guardians. All right, here's the next one. What is the first step to take to educate my local court system about people with IDD? Can we educate both attorneys and judges at the same time? If you have a bar association, you can. A good conduit to both the judges and the defense bar and the prosecution side is through your local bar association. We have very active bar associations at the county and state level. I'm a member of both, and one of the things I do is provide as much training as I can through that. Um, judges are ordinarily members of their bar associations, just like uh, counsel, counsel and prosecutors are. So it's a good way to get to all of them at the same time. Hopefully, they do ongoing training like they do here for our judiciary, both at our municipal and superior court level. If they have opportunities like that, too, to try and take advantage of those. Go right to your administrative office, of course, or whatever you call your court management system, and ask them when they do training for their judges and how, and see whether or not we can come part of that agenda. All right, this question is from Teresa. Does your agency also provide support for jail detainees with intellectual disabilities, for example, seeing that they're separated from the general jail population? We try to. That's one of the reasons that we try and have a, a relationship with the social service group in every one of our county jails. County jails here are independent entities, uh, to say the least, and they really operate independently. So it's important for us to try and have that relationship with social services. Uh, one of the things we do request if it's needed is that the individual be kept out of general talk. Um, often our clients are held in a medical unit. Uh, one of the dangers and one of the things to make sure you're aware of and know about is that depending on how the jail is set up, that may mean that your client will end up in isolation for a good portion of the day. So you want to ensure that they're safe that they're not in a position to be injured or, or taken advantage of by other inmates. But the other side of that point is uh, isolation is not a good fit for anyone. You don't want them to, to have to experience that if, if that's not the only option. So a, a good thing to do is to try your best to get to know your local warden the county, here in New Jersey, the County Wardens Association, uh, to try and have that relationship, know who the social service people are so that you can impact on what the appropriate the, the best option is that they can't get them out. <laughs> can't get them out all the day. All right. Um, can you repeat the states that have programs like yours and what makes a program most successful? The one, now, these are the ones I'm aware of, and I think it's possible, uh, Leanne, at the, at the ARC of the U.S., I know you've done some work in, in uh, identifying programs around the country. Um, we just did some quick research maybe a year ago because we wanted to have a sense of who else was out there. And the ones we found were North Dakota, Colorado, Georgia, 
District of Columbia. And in Missouri, there was a program just focused on St. Louis County, the city of St. Louis. Uh, and I've spoken to them over the phone. They appear to do exactly the same thing that we do, just in that smaller geographic area. Um, and Colorado is doing some, some really good stuff, too. I think it's uh, the Arc of Aurora and the Arc of Colorado have virtually the same program that we do. Um, I Obviously, I, and I do think it's one of the best options is a level of case management, as I, as I like to refer to it, extreme case management, where you really have the ability to have uh, that level of involvement with the client. I think, unfortunately, because it, it's, um, it's a high maintenance program, I think it's really the best way to ensure that the, the individual is going to be successful. And Jessica, this is Leanne. How are you? <laughs> Thank you so much for the, for the wonderful job you're doing. I did want to mention that um, if anyone wants to know more about what programs are going on nationally, they can go to uh, the national. Hey, sorry everyone. I think we're having some issues with audio with WebEx. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, all right, we'll jump right back in with one more question. Um, is the sex offender issue a problem in all states? I would bet yes. Is that my is that the answer? I, I that would be my guess. Um, I have to tell you, every single state has some version of Megan's law. It's been held, upheld as constitutional in all 50 states. So everybody has some level of registration and some level of community notification. And I guarantee you that every state has some version of supervision for life, whether you call it parole supervision for life, community supervision for life, some mechanism for supervising sex offenders in the community. It's, a, it's a, an issue across the country. Um, not to get into the specifics about what its effectiveness, because we really don't have any data that tells us that it's effective on any level, but nonetheless, for our clients, that can be very challenging for them to meet those obligations. And there are obligations placed on you as a sex offender. It also is, I, I know somebody had a, had a question about job development, so I'm assuming some of you are support services and job developers. You know that finding jobs for individuals with a sex offending history is probably the most challenging. It, it simply is. Even in jobs where it's not relevant, employers are very reluctant to hire. So yes, I think that, that sex offending, uh, the impact of being convicted of a sex offense is across the board around the country. And I also think that the levels of prosecution have gone up since the original Megantel statute was passed. Here in New Jersey, we passed our first one in 1994. You probably know Washington State passed the first one of Community Protection Act back in 1990. But that's what now, 20, 25 years, and we're, we're not going to rely on my math skills. But over the course of those years, there's no question that we've seen an increase, an increase in sex assault investigation prosecution across the board. All right, Jessica, we are out of time for today. So thank you so much for this thoughtful and wonderful presentation. It's really exciting to hear what you're doing there in New Jersey. Um, we'll let everyone know that next month's webinar on September 25th will be on fetal alcohol spectrum disorder um, and talking a little bit more about that and the impact in the criminal justice system, particularly for suspects and offenders. Um, don't forget to use our information referral and TA request service. So if you've got questions, email us at nccjdinfo at the arc.org. Um, and that's all we've got today. Thank you, Ms. Ogenheim, and don't forget to register for our next webinar. Thank you.